My name is Andreas Kleber. I manage Quality Associates and I guess we're all very familiar nowadays with crises. I think we're pretty much over the latest one with COVID, but I think that just highlights the sort of environment that we live in in general that we don't always have full control over everything. But what I really want to talk about today is how we can actually leverage our experience when we have dealt with crises to actually set ourselves up to deal with potential crises more effectively into the future. And so the title for today is Never Let a Good Crisis Go to Waste. So my own backgrounds, uh, we work with a whole range of different um, manufacturers, uh, retailers, uh, packaging companies, distribution companies, and so on. And we work very comprehensively in the quality and food safety space. So that includes things like food safety culture, it includes TASIB and MASIB, so food fraud and food defense, and clearly HACCP as well. And so these are all systems that have been designed to actually help us manage specific crises with food safety. We also do a lot of training in this area, so I won't dwell on that now, um, but basically I want to get stuck into the uh, session for today and the topics that we're going to be covering today is what are some of the current crises that we have to deal with. So it's not just COVID that's uh, on the horizon for the food industry at the moment. Uh, we're going to have a look at what a couple of the GFSI standards have to say about crisis management. And then we'll talk about the elements of a crisis management or business continuity plan, how we best make decisions for our business, but also for the consumer. We're going to have a look at some preventative actions and how we then execute the plans that we build to basically be able to deal with a crisis situation should it eventuate. So I like this definition of a crisis. It's a time when a difficult or important decision must be made. And I think this highlights uh, how we have to change our thinking. We can't think about a crisis as a uh, panic uh, mode. We have no control. We don't really know what's going to happen. Uh, as a business, we can't really manage our future like that. We need to have systems where we anticipate and where we can execute plans to deal with crises as they happen. If we don't plan A, we're going to have more crises. Uh, and B, we're not going to very effectively deal with those. And so it really should be a situation where we're prepared and then we basically make decisions and execute. And those decisions may be difficult or important, but we are not fully out of control. So I think that's a big uh, change in mindset uh, that as an industry uh, we need to take. And from that then flow uh, a whole range of other things such as preparedness training and so on, so that actually within the business, everybody knows what they need to do uh, when a crisis does come along. And so clearly with COVID, that's been the biggest test of humanity in the last 50, 60 years, I would say. So it's a very significant issue. And one of the things that came along with that is that supply chains were disrupted and we're seeing a lot more food fraud. But we've also seen a lack of labor, so crops not being harvested. Abattoirs have been shown to be uh, environments where there's a high chance of people getting infected. So really there's a whole risk to the entire food supply chain if we don't manage that properly. On top of that, we've seen some regulatory changes, not yet in Australia, but when Europe is banning uh, colors like titanium dioxide, um, because of health concerns for workers and consumers, at some stage that will flow through in what we can produce in Australia. And do we have a plan to deal with those sort of changes? And then there's a whole range of activism out there, whether it's anti-halal, uh, which is very misguided because if we want to export into Asia, that's not a position that we can take, or veganism that is uh, certainly overseas quite active, uh, but also in Australia, they're all sort of situations that we have to anticipate and be able to deal with uh, going forward. Some of the business related crises that we see out there is when processing and equipment failure occurs. And so we need to make a decision whether product needs to be withdrawn because of quality issues 
or recalled because there's a significant food safety issue. There could be regulatory failures. We see in Australia still a high number of recalls because of incorrect labels being applied. And that often comes down to our systems and human error, but we do need to make sure that we can uh, act if this occurs. There's non-compliance with imported goods at times or of ingredients. And we've seen recalls because, uh, for example, ethylene oxide has been used as a sterilant in India and those products ended up in Australia. There's system failures. And I think one of those that we will see a lot more of are ransomware attacks. Over the last two years, that has escalated significantly and a number of Australian food businesses like JBS, like Lions, had actually significant issues where they couldn't produce, where client records were potentially exposed. So this is a huge area that we need to focus on. And then you can have uh, human resource issues as well. Um, and sometimes when human resource uh, is not managed appropriately, when people are underpaid, those sort of situations, you then elevate the risk of uh, food uh, attacks uh, because people want to get back at whoever they feel aggrieved by. So there are risks that come along with those and we need to manage them. So looking at SQF in the first instance, as far as the GFSI standard is concerned, this now talks about crisis management planning. So it's not just talking about uh, food safety, but it talks about crises in general, even though it does still focus quite a bit about uh, food safety, but clearly it starts looking at things like flood and drought and fires and tsunamis that can actually disrupt uh, supply chains altogether. So the requirement is a crisis management plan based on the understanding of known potential dangers uh, that can impact on the site's ability to deliver safe food shall be documented by senior management. So it's not just food safety, but being able to deliver food at all. And in here, it uh, has a few examples of those dangers. In addition to flood, drought and so on, it's severe weather events, warfare, civil unrest, computer outages, pandemics, loss of electricity, and so on. So there's quite a few different things in here already that you need to consider. And the plan has to outline the methods and responsibility the site shall implement to cope with such a business crisis. And so then there are a number of uh, related requirements within that as well. Now, the next clause is really very important. It says the crisis management plan shall be reviewed, tested, and verified at least annually with gaps in appropriate corrective actions documented. So here we have a whole encompassing clause that basically says anything to do with uh, crisis management needs to be tested. In the past, it's been mock recalls. After that, we started looking at food fraud systems needing to be validated and food defense system ne needing to be tested once a year. But this goes much uh, beyond that now. And so basically the whole of business needs to be tested whether we're capable to recover and deal with crises as they arise. And I'll make a few comments on how you might be able to go about some of these things. And then you need to have records, uh, which is quite clearly always a requirement. BSCGS, it talks about the company shall have procedures designed to report and effectively manage incidents and potential emergency situations that impact food safety, legality, or quality. So again, quite broad, not just food safety as such. So then you need to have contingency plans. You need to look at a number of different types of events, very similar to SQF. Um, it talks about you need to test your systems in relation to malicious contamination or sabotage. So food defense comes in here. Uh, cyber attacks you need to protect your business against. And so we're seeing these uh, recurring trends and issues that these standards are asking the uh, um, companies to basically comply with and make sure that our food supply is safe and can continue into the future. So uh, a lot more to think about uh, going forward as far as our GFSI standards are concerned. 
So then if you want to manage a crisis, you need to start planning first up. So you need a business continuity plan that looks at all of those different facets. Uh, it doesn't need to rewrite all of your recall procedures. You can simply uh, reference some of those procedures in your business continuity plan. So that's fine. So it's not starting totally from scratch. But I think one of the things in the past when I asked people about their business continuity plans, uh, most uh, quality team members would say, well, senior managers have one sitting somewhere on the shelf, but we never really use it. So that's because the HACCP team is concerned with recall uh, testing, and that's pretty much where it ends. So in a business continuity plan, you need a risk management plan. So you assess various risks, look at their impacts, and you need then an instance response plan. So you have an immediate response checklist, so you don't overlook something when you start dealing with the crisis. You need to have evacuation and emergency procedures. Uh, you need to know about what emergency kits you have, but also document safekeeping. Where are the key documents and records stored? Are there backups? Can we get to them if we need them? Responsibilities and contacts lists, incidents logs, they're all part of the documentation that you set up. And then you need to have a plan on how you recover and you then need to maintain, rehearse and review like in uh, most systems that you're dealing with. So the risk assessment needs to be quite broad. So you need to look across your business, all the various functions, but you also need to assess your supply chain. And that's not really different to things like TASIP and VASIP, where actually the whole supply chain is risk assessed compared to HACCP, which tends to be focused on a site in general. Uh, but with TASIP and VASIP, we've really evolved into looking more broadly at our entire supply chain. And the same thing needs to happen with crisis management because the disruption can come from any of those stages. There are two different ways uh, that, need to, uh, that this needs to be approached in. And the first one is from the top down. So the C-suite, the senior managers, need to have input and drive this. They need to have ownership of what goes on in the business. And so they need to be involved. And then you also build from the bottom up from your HACCP teams that uh, basically comprehensively look after food safety and quality and also the TASIP and VASIP systems feed into that. So you have a top down and bottom up uh, approach as far as building those crisis management plans. And then you need to rehearse. And the only way to really rehearse is to set up a scenario that's realistic, that could actually happen within your business, and that tests all of the different elements of the business continuity plan. So it should be looking not just at recalls or mock recalls being part of that, but what HR function can deal with that, what's your public relations like, uh, legal, uh, management of issues that might arise and it needs to really involve the senior management if they're not facilitating and participating then really they're not testing themselves they're not learning how they need to manage the company in a crisis situation so you set up a scenario it may include a mock recall uh, you don't tend to tell everybody what the scenario is so that should be uh, quite tightly kept uh, by the facilitators and external facilitation can be uh, quite useful because that keeps everybody on the same path. You can evolve a scenario uh, and you can also then start uh, giving feedback that's quite independent from the business because it might be quite difficult to give um, senior management feedback uh, if you're a facilitator of a rehearsal like that. And the best way to run it is then to have a phased rollout of the crisis. So not everything happens at once. So you kick off uh, on one day, you might then run into the next day and every two hours or so, you might then have a scenario that's evolving. And then at the end of it, clearly you need to have a look and review and implement those learnings. When you make decisions, clearly you want to be consumer centric. If you're hurting your uh, consumer in some way, you're not dealing with that, you're not going to have a business for long. So you need to consider who is the highest at risk uh, consumer. You need to 
make sure you don't operate under a false sense of certainty. So testing and sampling plans have their limits. And so if you had a particular issue and you sample to a sample plan, uh, there's still an opportunity for you not to pick things up. So you need to actually uh, think beyond just those we've tested, we haven't found it, we don't need to deal with it. We need to think about severity and likelihood and as HACCP um, practitioners, we should all know about that. And at the end of the day, though, the senior leadership is going to make a call. And so in that sense, if we're in the HACCP team, if we're quality, uh, staff in a business, we need to guide senior leadership to make the right decision by the consumer. And so that's part of uh, our role is to be really that advocate for the consumer in that discussion. So preventive action, uh, business uh, planning clearly, failures will happen. So we need to have some pre-planned responses, even from a PR perspective, for example. We need to address human behaviors and not just systems because that's where failure often happens. And we need to start integrating our systems. We can't just keep operating in silos. This is HACCP, this is TACCP, this is our business continuity plan. They all feed into each other and are related to each other. So we can't operate them in separate systems anymore. We need to have some business protection. So insurance is going to be an important part of that. And so that's clearly something your senior leadership needs to consider. If you're looking at the business risk assessment, we can really look at a whole spectrum of business behaviors from reactive to committed, proactive or instinctive actions on food safety. And I would say on the left-hand side there, the businesses are very system centric, whereas on the right, they're much more people centric. And it's really on the right that we want to be if we want to drive the correct behaviors, I guess. And that comes back to food safety culture. And I know Sharon's going to talk more about that, so I won't spend any time on that. But um, that's clearly a very important dimension when you're dealing with crises. So actioning the crisis management plan, um, the most senior person in the business must be the public face. So whoever's available at the most senior level, because otherwise the consumer, the general public, the media will not treat the response seriously. You're just going to look bad. So that person needs to be media trained so they can actually respond uh, appropriately. And the team that deals with the situation must have the right support of specialists. And so lawyers, uh, food safety risk specialists, PR agencies, consultants that may uh, lend additional support uh, can be really, really important. But you need to think about that previous, uh, before the crisis happens so you can actually engage those people in a meaningful uh, and timely manner. So that's quite important. And with the lawyer also, that gives you some legal protection and as far as what you have to share if something's under legal privilege, that gives you much more scope to operate and have serious discussions that you don't necessarily want to share. Um, framing the response has to be uh, believable. It has to be uh, customer centric. So you can't be vague. You can't just waffle and, and make some vague statements that aren't really meaningful to the consumer. And just saying, yes, we treat it seriously, um, you know, sorry, it happens. That doesn't really cut through. It needs to have real uh, acknowledgement of the consumer impact. You have to provide updates what you're actually concretely doing. And so having training that goes along with that, uh, some PR companies are facilitating some of those as well. Uh, there's actually an opportunity to get yourself ready before something happens. And <clears throat> And the other thing there that I'm mentioning here is that it's not just the external communication. It's the internal business communication that's going to be critical. And that's because all those people are going to go home at the end of the day. They're going to talk to their families. They're going to jump onto Facebook. And if they get the story uh, wrong, if they're not being informed, if they all just think terrible things are happening, this isn't going to support your response or your business. So you need to effectively communicate internally as well as externally. 
So then the uh, crisis management pressure test is something that I would highly recommend. I facilitate those from time to time, but uh, the basic structure to those, we've talked that through today. Uh, business continuity programs are essential. Most businesses have them, but it's probably worthwhile to actually review them and see how that integrates with your standard requirements and your other systems like HACCP, TACCP and BASIP. And then if you are looking at crises, a lot of them are in the TACCP and BASIP space nowadays. So you need to have training. Uh, and there's the sort of things we can offer as well. So facilitation, consultation and implementation. Uh, but basically all of those systems need to be up to date and up to scratch.